Welcome to Shop Talks, which is a production of In Kitchen. Check out InKitchen.com. Check out our YouTube channel. This and all the videos of, uh, I mean, and all the talks we have are up on uh, YouTube. Check those out. It's all brought to you free because of Los Angeles Apparel, Alpha Broder, Stalls, Transfer Express, LAT Apparel, Hirsch, Howard Custom Transfers, and Lane 7. You wouldn't have this free information without them. I'm here with uh, my compatriot here, Stan Banks, and we're going to uh, have a panel of experts here. We got Jerry Chard, we got Art Doby, we got Dave Macon. Uh, Jerry is from uh, Kiwo, and Art is from Chromaline, and Dave is from Saudi, and we're gonna talk about screen making, uh, give you some tips on whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced, what kind of things you want to look at for making good screens. So, gentlemen, it's called screen making for a re screen printing for a reason, huh? Screen ma making is a bit important, I would say. Um, let's kick it off maybe uh, a beginner. What are they going to think of first? What, 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 what are they, to put together uh, their screen making, what, what are the first essentials that they got to have? Well, um, you know, you want to es establish yourself as, you know, screen tension. You know, you want to make sure that you've got good tension on your screens, because without that, first off, you're not going to be able to coat a screen properly. All right, and then uh, you know, it's it's very basics of you know, you always finish your coating on the squeegee side. That's your last pass with the coating trough pushing the emulsion to the print side, creating a stencil profile. Drying your screens print side down so that gravity retains that emulsion there so you have a good gasket that when you eventually get to your, your printing process. And then, you know, dialing in your exposure properly. You know, everybody today, it seems, it's like, all right, I want the fastest emulsion. I want to expose my screens in three seconds. And that's, that's kind of a ridiculous approach because, all right, you expose your screen in three seconds. Then you've got to go and develop it, wash the image out. And that takes three or four minutes. So where, where are you say, you know, if you've got two guys doing this, the guy who's doing the exposing, he's building up a stack of screens that the other guy he can't get to wash them out fast enough. So um, you want to have you know, a product that gives you the properties that you need for your process, the, what you're using for kind of ink you're printing, the kind of chemicals you're cleaning up with, and is going to give you the resolution and edge quality that you're looking for. Actually, you know, none of them are going to say it, but the first thing in making good screens is to have a good supplier. Like, so that's one reason I have these guys up here. These are all people that you can trust. They have companies behind them that you can trust. So you either want a distributor or a, a technical rep from a company like these three companies. Um, and I wouldn't recommend really too many others. And you, you need that resource. They're going to help you get your exposures right. They're going to help you when you have a problem. And that is actually one of the key things is to have some allies that you can uh, reach out to when you're having a problem. All right, what else What else they need in the basic screen room there, huh? Well, one of the uh, main things that I will recommend strongly is controlling the humidity and the temperature in your screen room and in particular how you dry your screens after coating prior to going to exposure if your screens are not thoroughly dry and you know as as our friend who's probably walking around richard grease always says i can hold a tomato all day my hand never gets wet but i know on the inside it's not dry so part of the key here is understanding and getting a grip on when is dry really dry. So basically, you really do need to pay attention to the drying sequence. Use some elevated temperature. Lower the humidity if you can buy a drying cabinet. Create a dry box. 
put a dehumidifier in it if it doesn't come with a heating element or something else. So what you theoretically would like to do is have that at maybe 90 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit and humidity no more than 40% and your screens will thoroughly dry, and I'm still talking maybe a 110 with a 1-2 coating on it, they'll dry within two hours, probably 90 minutes. Uh, if you really think that you can put Versus them... Versus what? If you don't have a heater, well, you're if talking you don't maybe have that, you have you know, you to do it overnight just, probably, right? Yeah, you, you can't just put the screen on the floor and blow a fan on it and expect that it's dry in 20 minutes. It's really not dry. The danger in this is if there's water molecules within the emulsion still, they will inhibit the crosslink. So then you spent this time picking out an emulsion because it has certain characteristics. It resists water, it resists solvent, whatever it might be. If you can't crosslink it properly because there's moisture still internal, you'll never see the fruition of what the formulation was intended to provide you with respect to tolerance and resistance level. Good so, emulsion gone bad, huh? <laughs> yeah, that would be it. So uh, I'll, I'll let Dave add to his, his I don't know if we're going to top the tomato analogy, though. <laughs> so, uh, you know, as I thought about this, low-end to high-end screens. What is a low-end screen? I think that's a screen that we don't know anything about. You know, so you may go to your distributor and you may say, I want a 230 mesh. Are you getting a 230 mesh? And if so, a lot of us forget to ask what size micron we want. You know, your mesh selection really comes down to your success as to what you want to print. If you're gonna print a lot of half tones, you better get a mesh that will, will at least cover two threads and two openings of your smallest half tone. So we gotta start thinking about in the beginning, um, Jerry mentioned uh, tension. Tension is absolutely important and different mesh counts can handle different tensions. Your frames also determine what tension that you can hold. So I really am an advocate of controlling all the variables through standard operating procedures. So you think about um, your frame itself. They come in a variety of, of, uh, of thicknesses. You know, you can get a .125, which is a fairly heavy stretch and glue frame, but it can hold a better tension. You can get a .095, which is gonna be a little bit thinner. It's not gonna hold as much as that .125, as well as a 0.070, you know, which is one of the thinner ones. Lightweight, great, but the more tension you put on it, the more it's going to bow inside. So your frame will really determine what kind of tension you're capable of holding. And as we consider tension, which I think is something really important in the whole screen printing process, which helps with the print, it helps with the, the detail that we're putting on, it helps with the registration, that we stay consistent with your tensions. If you can maintain that standard frame thickness and and some people are like well how do i know how thick it is you know it's a simple thing as way in your frame you'll have a good idea that you have the same frame stock thickness so that you can maintain the same tensions now different meshes will hold different tensions so you should really be considering getting as close to possible on each of those meshes with the tension you know my 110 can hold a lot more than my 230 or my 305 but the closer your tensions are to each other, the better your registration, the better your success. So I do like to think, you know, tension is one of those first things that you should consider. Get the right screen, get the right mesh, and then what are you going to print? You know, I mean, I, if we're going to be plastisol, find a good plastisol emulsion, you know. We all have great emulsions. We all have, you know, you think about the solids content of that emulsion. The higher the solids, the more EOM you're going to get, emulsion over mesh, which means you'll have less mesh interference. So good things to consider are, like I say, your frame, your mesh selection, your emulsion. What do you want to print? Not all emulsions will work straight across the board. There are a lot that will take care of business, but if you're struggling somewhere, it's something to talk to your distributor about how can I get a, a better result. You also, um, I kind of was made aware of this when I just visited uh, Chromaline recently. The, Emulsion needs to be tied to what kind of exposure you have as well, right? Like a lot of uh, beginners have LEDs. That would require a different emulsion, right? Yeah, I mean, I would take a look at what is the photochemistry in your material in the emulsion that you have. Some of them have different spectral interest 
compared to other emulsions, so they're looking for a certain wavelength to be emitted from the lamp in your exposure system. So some emulsions are a little more, say, tuned to the frequency that an LED or a laser outputs, a higher frequency around 405 nanometer. Other emulsions will be just fine with the spectral output of your lamp system, whether or not that's a uh, metal halide lamp or you have UV fluorescent bulbs or what have you. Uh, I will suggest this, no emulsion is really oriented to work well with a halogen lamp. So be careful on some of those social media suggestions that say run over to Home Depot and buy a 500 watt halogen lamp. Um, the spectral output barely overlaps any emulsions photochemistry needs. So always be sure you look for what does my emulsion want photographically from the lamp? What does my lamp output? How do those two overlap so that I get a good thorough cross link of the materials? So I got yeah, a question for you guys. Um, how do we like, what are things that we can be looking for to know that we're doing it wrong? So, you know, if you're starting out a shop, just get into it. You know, all we want to do is something that works, but how do we figure out like little areas that can help us improve because we're coating it by hand, we're burning it for 30 seconds just because we might've saw that on a video. What are things that we should be looking for to allow this process to be easier or to get us a better output? Yeah, what kind of outcomes, uh, to tag on that, what kind of outcomes do you see when you know you're not go going right? <laughs> This is a fun question to answer because we see so many variances throughout the industry. With your emulsions, if you don't have some kind of an exposure calculator, and you know, like we will show a Stouffer scale, a 21 step scale, proper exposure using film is going to be a solid seven, which means everything else beyond it will wash away. I can show you one of those after this. Um, but if you don't have that, a good rule of thumb, as Art was talking about there, there are different sensitivities to the different emulsions. So you can have an extremely fast exposing emulsion or you can have one that has a lot of latitude, which means our window of opportunity is huge. Dual cures are usually pretty good for this. If you have a poor light source, they typically compensate pretty well that you could underexpose or overexpose and still have a pretty good screen that's going to that's going to be durable for you. But if you look at something more like a pure photopolymer, something that's going to be really fast, our window of opportunity went from here to here, and we've got to hit it right or you're going to have issues. One of the best ways that we can say if you don't have any kind of quality control for that is after you develop it, you develop it from the substrate side of the screen. That's where your art is, your glass is, your light has gotten to. Did it make it through to the squeegee side of the screen? Simply feeling the back side, that squeegee side as you're developing. If it, if it feels slimy, if it feels like a fish scale, you know right away you are underexposed. I mean, you can get closer, but that's just kind of one of those touchy feel moments to be able to say, yeah, I got to give it some more time. You know, or if it's, it, it should feel wet, just like the substrate side would, you know, because it did get its amount of light. So just a good rule of thumb, you know, as a, as a physical visual check to it. But it's always best to have a real exposure calculator to dial you in correctly because a properly exposed screen is success at the press. There was a hint in all that, though. If you use a dual cure emulsion, then it's going to be easier because you don't have to get it exact, and you still probably have a pretty good screen that you can. You know, may not print the Mona Lisa, but you can print, you know, T-shirt side hustle on there. They, they they handle different light sources quite well, but again, we're after speed now. You know, we want to get the the dual cures typically aren't as high of a solids content to the emulsion, so. The higher the solids, the more we can get away from the mesh and the more edge definition that you can get along your prints. So these new photopolymers are great, but again, our light source might determine it's not right for us. Yeah, I mean, some of the things, I mean, you know, again, you want to try, always try and, <laughs> screen making is a science, but it's a very basic science when you really think about the whole thing. If, if my stencil is coated as thick as my fingers are right now, and I do my exposure from the top down. If I'm underexposed, this part is going to wash away because it never got cross-linked with the UV light. All right? But now this part here is going to still be underexposed. It's not going to have a full cure to it. So 
eventually something is going to break down or you're going to have difficulty reclaiming at the end because solvents that you use to clean the inks are attacking and locking in your emulsion and things like that. So, again, all right, let's say you figure out, uh, you know what, 30 seconds looks good for my exposure. My suggestion is shoot it for 40 and see how it looks. Shoot it for 50 and see how it looks. Use an exposure calculator. You get to do that all at once. But I want you to push your exposure time to the f maximum until you start to, like, cannot open up the fine detail that you're trying to hold. And then you just back it down 5%. And now you know you're going to get solid good cure, you're not going to get breakdown, you're not going to have reclaim issues and things like that. Maximize it. Those few extra seconds or whatever is not going to change your life. But how much time is wasted trying to reclaim a screen that is locked up and trying to get the stains out of that mesh because if you don't get the stains out, it's going to affect your next screen. and. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a constant domino of problems. So what are all those things of a bad screen? So you got uh, haze, which is uh, the, the color of the ink locks into the screen mesh, From right? From your image. You, you got, got pinholes. What else you got that if you know you're doing a bad job? What, what are the signs of a bad screen? Well, I'd like to just get on top of what Jerry just said there, which is when you are on the shy side of full crosslink, when you don't have enough exposure on here. Your screen is a little more susceptible to everything else that it's going to see on the print floor. Your press wash, screen wash, screen opener, ink retarder, all these things. They have an easier time having effect on the emulsion because it's not at its full level of resistance because the exposure was shy. All those chemicals in turn then have counter effect on your reclaimer. And this is why you have a lot of problems reclaiming. So as backwards as it sounds, the more you cure and harden your stencil on the screen, the easier it is to take it off later. Okay, so that that's is not intuitive, I would say, right? No, it's not intuitive. Expose it more, harden it more, it resists more of the other things. They have less effect causing lock-in. It'll come off a lot easier and reclaim that way. And you know what? One of the things that I hear all, uh, quite a bit Somebody will complain, say, you know what, yeah, my emulsion, this emulsion pinholes. It, I get so many pinholes with this emulsion. Now, I don't work with them, but I can guarantee all their emulsions and our emulsions, we have stopped putting pinholes in them years ago. <laughs> you know, no, the pinholes are a product of um, bad prep and cleanliness of your screens, your artwork, your exposure unit glass, all these different things. If you have a good process, pinholes will disappear. They just do. But guaranteed, we don't have them in our emulsions. All right, what else? Well, what a, one of the things here. I wanted to touch on, which, which Dave triggered a little earlier, uh, how many people are using static aluminum tubular frames? Okay, and the rest of you guys, I assume, are on roller frames? Okay, so in either, one of the things Dave mentioned was he talked about, oh, you get the frame at 1.25 or 0.95. So really what he's referencing is the thickness of the sidewall of that two inch, one and a half, two and a half inch extrusion that's used. How many people are using film product and then therefore as your photo tool and then you have to put it inside a vacuum bag? So everybody else is on some form of CTS? Well, a CTS Don't will... Don't vellum. <laughs> if you're using film or inkjet film or vellum, anything like that that you put on the screen and then you stick it in a vacuum, point I was going to get to is you don't have to have your vacuum all the way up to a full 27 inches of mercury on your on your scale for the vacuum itself. You'll get pressure at 20. When you go all the way up at the extreme of the vacuum, if you're using film on a screen on the vacuum back, the vacuum blanket will actually 
expand your frame a little bit up at that high pressure level. So now I've put the image onto the screen at a little bit of an expanded position. And as soon as I let the vacuum go and turn everything off, it will come back in. So now my dimensional accuracy is going to be short. And if I'm doing layers, registration, four color process, what have you, uh, I'm going to have issues with registration that way. So what I was leading into then is be careful of just how hard your vacuum pulls on your vacuum back. You only need about 20 inches of mercury on the on your dial. Back to uh, cold in the screen. Earlier, you guys mentioned uh, somebody mentioned two one uh, two one uh, as far as like the ratio of cold in it. When and you also said finish on the squeegee side. So can you kind of expand upon you know what is a good uh, technique when it comes to coating the screen? How many times should we be coating each side? What is a common practice? There's a variety of coders on the market. Most of you will have a coder that has two edges to it, a sharp edge and a round edge. I talked earlier about an EOM. And as Jerry mentioned before, we should always, always start our coating technique on the substrate side, the side of the t-shirt. The purpose of that is we are going to be pushing all the air through the fabric. We should be building our EOM, our stencils, with the round edge of a coder, okay? And there can be different radiuses to it, but a sharp edge wasn't designed to build an EOM. It was designed to take care of something later that we called an RZ. So build your stencils, you know, and that would be two passes from the, sque from the substrate side. Really, as you coat it, depending on the viscosity of those emulsions, you can look back to the squeegee side and see if it's glossed up or if it's still got its dry spots. If it's got a dry spot, you need another pass. We got to get all that air pushed out of the fabric. Now you're going to build your stencil thickness. This is the gasket between the screen and the t-shirt. This is what takes away mesh interference. So if you come back now from the squeegee side and you coat, don't coat fast. I think this is where some people think we do put pinholes in our emulsion. The faster you go, the faster you stretch the emulsion's capabilities, it's chemistry. So it may not be able to get everything in through like it needs to do to be able to cross-link properly. So we say six inches per second, and I think that holds pretty true to every competitor's emulsion. Six inches per second. The slower we go, the better we build. But we need to build with the right edge of the coder. Some of these coders, you know, a sharp edge would be about a, a, half, a half a millimeter. You know, most I think are going to have a half millimeter on one side and a full millimeter on the other side, which is your round edge. So that two and one is going to build you on a high solids emulsion, you know, something like a pure photopolymer, 45% solids. Um, it's going to build you a really thick EOM in less passes. Whereas if you tried to do that with a sharp edge, you're going to get a lot of mesh interference. You're going to get those little jagged edges along the side. You're going to get your dots are going to grow because we didn't get enough emulsion in there to fill in those valleys. So you're trying to get that perfect dot, but it's going to spill out where it didn't get enough emulsion in there. So one of those things is, as I say, you know, make sure you use the right round edge to coat, coat from the correct sides and coat at the correct speed. I want to add, uh, did you have something you want to put in first? No. no. Okay. Um, I wanted to add something because it relates directly uh, here to what Dave said, is all emulsions, certainly from the panel here, you can get a data sheet from the supplier that gives you some specs and things on it. And the one thing that doesn't really get discussed or looked at very much is the viscosity. An emulsion on your data sheet, it should tell you what viscosity the emulsion is. And I bring this up because, for example, the comp my company I work for has two emulsions that uh, particularly that each has 50% solids. So they're kind of equal. In fact, they're both blue. So, you know, I mean, they're very, very similar, except one has more than twice the viscosity of the other. So it's heavier. And what that means is on a on a similar pressure, similar speed, it moves less through mesh. So if I have to do some detail work and I'm gonna go up to a 280 or a 305, if I'm using the emulsion, even though the solids are the same, I'll get a good stencil, but the question is how much wet film coating will I leave on the screen 
So when I'm up on a tight mesh with a small aperture between threads, like a 305 or 280, I may need to go a little slower or use a little more pressure or maybe even apply another stroke when my viscosity is very high because I have to get the same amount of material through the mesh out to the other side. When it's more fluid with a low viscosity, it flows through rather readily. Or if I'm using either one on a 110 mesh or a 156, yeah, it'll go through pretty simple. So just pay attention to your viscosity of that material when you're using a finer count mesh to make sure that you're able to get a sufficient amount through so you get the stencil you're looking for. What would be a standard viscosity? What is viscosity and what would be kind of like a standard for what you should be looking for? Well, I, I don't think that there's actually, there's not really a wrong number. It's a number you need to know, you know, so that you're aware. Pay, certainly pay attention to the solids content right? You may end up paying a couple dollars more per gallon if it's at 45% or higher, and maybe it's a couple bucks low if it's 38% or 40% on solids. But that also means you may need, you may need be able to do the higher solids uh, maybe on a one-in-one a -one or, a, or a, uh, a simple coating like that, whereas if it's a lower solids, maybe I have to add another stroke to get to the same thickness. So it's, gonna, it's basically going to depend. I, I will say one thing that I know you guys will agree. Emulsion is not probably the place in your shop to save money. Like, you're coating a lot of screens with a gallon of emulsion, and if you have screen problems, that is going to cost you way more than any emulsion would ever cost you, ever. Well, you know, and it's right. And so I always tell people, I mean, what is the business that we are in? is the screen printing business. Screen. If you don't make a good screen, you're not gonna have a quality pop product coming out the end of that dryer or off that press or whatever, you know, way you look at it. You have to make a good screen. And unfortunately, we have all seen that the screen room is probably the most neglected. The, less, the least amount of investment is in the screen room. It's all, oh, well, I've got this great new press, and I've got a new dryer to do this, and I've got a folding machine, and I've got this. Well, what kind of light source do you know? I don't know. It's something. It turns on. It's bright. It's good. And I'm like, you know, it, it drives us crazy because if you invest properly in the key pro part of the business, you're going to be successful, and you're not going to have all those worries about breakdown and pinholes and this and that, all that stuff goes away when you do it properly right from the beginning. I mean, how many people degrease their screens before they're going to dry them and coat them with emulsion? Thank you. I, that, you know what? Shame on the rest of you that didn't raise your hands. Degreasing. We talked about pinholes and contamination that gets on there. Residue. But it costs like three or four cents a screen, doesn't it? Oh, my God, yeah. And I, actually, I think we've all worked together really hard to get it down to about a penny. And it's, it's just like, come on. Clean it. I mean, I, I, I hate to use this as an example, but if you go and, uh, you know, fall down on the ground and your hand is all over the ground, things like that, and then you go over to the food truck, you get a hot dog, I'm betting you're going to go wash your hands before you get that hot dog. All right? Wash your screens before you use them, and we'll all be happy. Hot dogs, tomatoes, we get it all covered here. <laughs> so, so We're going on to the food channel next. <laughs> going, going into the screen room, and you're ready to advance through this process, Like, what could you be looking for if you're coming from like a really, really entry-level exposure unit, and you want to get a, a faster, um, you know, start to invest in your, your screen room, where should you be making that investment? I'm going to say in the screen room, I think one of the things that will help you control and get the most repeatability would ultimately be an automatic coder. I mean, I think above all other technology available in the screen printing industry with laser to screen, with direct to screen, inkjet, waxjet, whatever, if you want repeatable consistency that's going to help you in your exposure, help you get the right 
hardness on the press and durability of the press, we've got to have consistency with how we coat our emulsion. Now, I will coat differently than Art if we have a coating competition, all right? And I'm sure Jerry and I could do different. Every one of us are going to coat differently even if we have the same emulsion and we have the same coating troughs. There will be a variable. So if somebody decides to call in sick and you have somebody else coat, there will be a difference and you may notice it in your print. So if I had to say the best place to start in the screen room would be get yourself an automatic coder. I mean, they're really not that expensive and they create the most awesome consistency throughout your whole process that can, that can guarantee you good results. You know, your screen makes your press run. Your press makes your company money. So we really need to look at the screen room and say, that's where we've got to make the investment because it will lead to your success in the future. Is there an idea of what size shop should be looking to get in, uh an automatic coder so is there a, maybe in a revenue mount or you know if you're in the auto you should definitely be doing it is there a kind of ideal area where you should know all right let's invest in an automatic screen coder i i say as early as possible you know if you're doing 20 screens a day that's 20 consistent screens a day so uh as early as possible in my opinion so after you have the 150 watt uh, bulb in the pie plate what do you what do you graduate to from that light source? I, I and I wanted to ask about light source that um, Rick just brought up. Um, That's how I started, by the way. There you go. Forty five minute exposures. <laughs> how many how many people have a lamp system, UV lamp system of some sort, right? Okay, and so on that system. You have, uh, if it's a large enough system and it's outfitted well, you've got a control box that sits here, which is known as the integrating system, the integrator. Um, if you have an LED system, you probably only have a timer, okay? Just how many minutes or seconds, and it turns on and turns off. On a bulb system, if it's not the most basic on a bulb system, you get a, a system that has an integrating unit connected to it. And there's a small photo cell that has an iris in front on a cable connected to it, stares at the bulb, and that integrating system will watch the bulb to lower in intensity because all bulbs lower over time and use in intensity. So it's no longer the same intensity striking the exposure plane with the screen after so many firings of exposure. So what that system will do for you is it will check the difference between when it was set up and calibrated and if it now notices 10% lower lamp intensity output, it will extend the exposure time by 10% more real time that we wait for it to finish for the same exposure setting to compensate. So it's kind of like, hey, you know, my oven was 375 and everything cooked for an hour. Well, now my oven only goes to 350. If I cook for an hour still using a timer, I'm short on cook. I didn't use enough cook energy. So if I compensate then and we run longer time at 350 than an hour, I'll get the same cook completion done. So that's what this does. And the reason I bring it up is I see a lot of folks who have these and there is a bypass switch just to go to seconds. And I can see the little LED is on telling me that they turned off the integrator and are just using seconds. So what that means is you are shorting yourself actual exposure dosage every time period, weekly, certainly monthly, et cetera. What you think you're delivering for an exposure is no longer the same, it's less. So that's one way, if you have this in your shop, on your system, be sure you're not using seconds and then you're actually using a light unit method of setting your exposure. If you don't have that, I guess you just got to do a lot of testing, right? If you, don't, if you don't have an integrating system and you have a bulb type system, then you're going to have to monthly run an exposure check. Maybe even every two weeks, run a check to see do I need to increase my exposure time. If you have an LED system, 
LEDs pretty much are what they are until they just stop working. So that's why you don't get that feature. You just get a timer. So as long as they illuminate, LEDs are pretty much what they are until they just stop. So they never give you an integrating system. That's more tied to a bulb type unit. Go to questions, maybe? Yes. All right, let's uh, go to questions. Where do I start to determine if the emulsion I'm using is right for the spectrum that's given off from my bulb and exposure unit? Do I, can well, I use a spec sheet to if, find out? No, I mean, what you want to think, I mean, if you look at a spectral graph of the sensitivity of an emulsion, it's basically like looking at the outline of a mountain. And it, you know, it's got peaks and, and, and downs and things. And, you know, depending on the emulsion you're using, you know, a dual cure is sensitive. You know, it peaks in uh, maybe, you know, the 365 nanometer range, where a pure photopolymer is more upward towards the 400 nanometer range and things like that. So you'd have to, you know, know that information, and then you have to be able to get a spectral readout of the, the light that you're using. And there's so many out there. I mean, uh, you know, companies, you know, Olek, you know, used to, you know, like Art was just talking about that with the integrator, the bulb, it's a metal halide. They used to get a spectral graph from them that showed the, 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 what that energy was coming out of that particular bulb. I don't, yeah, I don't know. On a lot of them, it's hard to find that now. All right, so, you know, this is something you figure out once, right? Right. <laughs> so you don't really want to become a, you know, chemical engineer over it. So can they ask you, like, if they yeah. say, I got this bulb, what emulsion you got sure. works with it? Do you so, know? So w what I would suggest is, number one, start with, what, am, what ink am I going to be printing? What type of ink am I going to be printing? If it's just Plastisol, honestly, pretty much any emulsion you can find will work with Plastisol. Plastisol is very um, safe. It, it, we're not going to get any trouble with that whatsoever. So it's not aggressive to the emulsion type material. So that being said, what you need to do then is use an exposure calculator to help you determine I'm using appropriately the right exposure for the screen I'm exposing. What mesh is it? How did I code it? What thickness was coded on it? And once I use that, I can confirm using the Stouffer scale that David mentioned, which is a very thin strip with levels of filtration. And there's some directions usually on the envelope it comes in that tells you how to work it. And that will confirm that you have reached a level of acceptable cure with that lamp for the screen that you put on. And then the proof in the pudding then comes in at that point, is it, is it holding up out on press? If I can mention along those same lines, you know, some of those things that we look for with an underexposed screen is also in the reclaim part of the process. Um, Underexposed screens will come out stringy and rough and hard and they'll leave a lot of stain inside it. If it's a dual cure emulsion that you add a diazo to, you'll usually see a diazo stain in there, not just an ink stain. Um, the other thing about that emulsion selection is what solvents or chemistries you're going to use at press. We prefer you not use any kind of a hot solvent, an acetone, a mineral spirit, or any kind of an aerosol opener because they you know, they're petroleum byproducts and mesh is a petroleum byproduct, you know. So you got two likes that are like, that like to set a stain. So if you use on some emulsions a chemistry that's too hot for it, it will lock it into the screen and you'll have a very, very difficult time trying to reclaim that. So again, with that emulsion selection, think about the chemistries that you use at your press. Other questions? So our company has been uh, doing manual uh, prepping for emulsion. Uh, what company would you recommend for an automatic uh, coder? No. <laughs> we all have them. Yeah, okay. they, all, they all have them. They're Which all one is the best one? No, we'll okay. talk to you. 
No, I think they'll make a good decision. No. <laughs> I can say that all theirs are good, really. They're not going to say it, but they are. Yeah. And, you know, they did, I don't know if they kind of got at it, but before you can afford a coder, at least have the same person coat your screens all the time. They kind of mentioned that. Cool. Uh, with the, like, a properly, with a properly, um, with a properly done screen, would you suggest you should be able to wash it out with a garden hose, or should you only be using a garden hose, or should you be using a pressure washer? So uh, I'll just repeat the question. So if it was um, uh, to reclaim, if it was a properly exposed screen, no, no, no. To, to, add, to open oh, your oh, image, to open, yeah. Oh. Okay. When you've exposed it and you wash it out, can you wash it out with a garden if, hose or you need a pressure washer? You can. I mean, we always tell people, like, if you have warm water, it helps your developing and things like that. Um, but you also the little things you have to think about is if I'm properly exposed but I'm having trouble wash opening up my image, you got to check your artwork. Or, you know, do you have good density that it's blocking the UV or are you getting penetration into it? Or are you getting some pre-exposure in your screen room prior to doing your exposure that you're getting a, a little layer of your emulsion that's getting some pre-exposure to it that's going to hinder that developing? I would, I would just throw in, you could use the garden hose, you could use the pressure washer. Um, you're not going to typically use a garden hose at reclaim time. You're going to use a pressure washer, right? And the the, the goal of that process is to literally strip everything off possible. So that being said, pressure washer in my hand, do, do the operators tend to get a little too close for our development process? So, you know, take a step or two further back if you only have a pressure washer at the developing sink because you're not, reclaim, you're, you're not reclaiming at that point. I'm removing what still remains to be water soluble. I have to give it a chance to soften up a little bit so then it will dissolve and then go down and be gone. So, uh, you know, that being said, yeah, you can use the pressure washer. Just recognize I'm not trying to drill it. No, use a garden hose. <laughs> Safer. <laughs> Any more questions? Questions out there? Mesh. Do you recommend S mesh or standard mesh? <laughs> I'd like to take a shot at that. What are you trying to accomplish? You know, that's really what's going to be your mesh. Um, what determines your mesh? S mesh or regular mesh? This is something that should be considered when you select your mesh. You know, you really need to know your micron size. You know, a 230 will have a, you know, a 31 micron, a 34 micron, or even a 40 micron thread. Some, it, it's, it's one of those things, what are we trying to do? Typically, the thinner thread is gonna have a more open area, so you should get better coverage with less ink laying down. So, but they are delicate. I mean, is your shop capable of producing uh, on a thin thread mesh? You know, you, you can't have as high of as high of an off contact. You can't have as high attention on it. Um, there's a lot more to control around the S threads. We they are amazing what they're capable of doing, though. The coverage and less prints, the details you're able to get because the ink can just flow so much better. In a laboratory, printing. right? In a laboratory, <laughs> yeah, but um, but. It's just one of those things. You do have to be more delicate with them, okay? There will be some changes to it, but it definitely has its advantages in the market. Water-based printers, even as an underbase, you know, it does a really good job helping you to develop that soft hand that you're after in the print. But do expect, with it being so delicate, you will go through quite a few more screens. Yeah, I mean, I have to agree with Dave. You know, basically, for those who aren't, you know, up on it, the S-thread is means it's a smaller thread size, same pitch of thread count per inch. So the weave is more open, so it's going to be thinner. Your apertures are bigger. So emulsion will go through easier when you coat. Ink will go through easier when you print. So 
look at the fact that there's less mesh structure because we've thinned out the diameter of the thread and we haven't added more threads. We've just made it a thinner thread. So structurally, what will happen is the thread gets a little stronger, higher modulus material to it. So it can be elongated a little more and you can get closer to the tension, say of a bigger thread and everybody likes that. But you have to be cognizant of what, what is my shop like can I handle this? Because when it's at a higher stress level, it, it's great on press to print with, but not if it gets manhandled. And if your shop is the type where we're busy, we got a lot of screens, we're gonna manhandle them, this and that, you, you could end up popping a higher percentage of those than anything else you have. And they're a little, little more pricey, so you, you gotta really weigh all that when you go into outcome versus outcome and expectations versus reality and price. All right. Any other pressing questions out there? All right. How about a hand for our uh, panelists here? I think all of you, uh, do you all on a, have a booth? I don't. Right. Saudi booth on the far side. Uh, QO right, there. right here. Yep. They're around to, uh, and they'll stick around for a few minutes now if you have questions. Um, I want to thank Los Angeles Apparel and Alpha Broda for being the main sponsors of this while you get this free information. Stalls, Transfer Express, LAT Apparel, Lane 7, Howard, and Hirsch also support this, as does Impressions. Check out InKitchen.com. Check out our YouTube channel. This will eventually appear on YouTube as well, and uh, you're welcome to check it out. It's always free due to the sponsors. Thank you for coming. we got a full program all day. Thanks.